don't want it to work, you can make it fail. If you do want it to work, you can make it work. And part of the challenge is finding the right vehicles to change over to and the right charging infrastructure. Well, I went and did a uh, survey um, a little while ago. He took a great delight in telling me that he installed 80 charging points in his car park. And when he took me up, he said, where are they? He said, oh, there they are. And there was 15 three-pin sockets. And then that's not a charging point. And please don't use them. And he said, well, why not? I said, right. And I opened the flat and said, you see that discoloration? That's because it's not rated to take that amount of current for that amount of time. It doesn't matter whether your car comes with it or not. You know, yes, okay, use it to get you out of trouble, but it's not it's not a sustainable way of charging the vehicle, you just can't do it. Why? Explain that. Because so essentially a 13, 13 so three pin socket is, is 13 amp rated, yeah? Yeah. But it's like a kettle. So a kettle runs for what, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, maybe a minute maximum. That's the length of time it's designed to run at that peak. And then it's designed to go away and the plastics and the metals that are used in those sockets are not designed to take 10, 11, 12 amps that a car will ask for for 10 hours straight and it will overheat and it will burn out. Please don't fall by the way that there are sockets, three pin sockets out there that are called EV sockets that don't stand up. It's, 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 they've basically upgraded the pins to handle more current but still won't handle it for as long as it needs to, to charge an EV properly. Several manufacturers of them they all come with, like I said, the seven pin, either a socket or a tethered lead, um, and they run from uh, 3.6 kilowatts, which is about 16 amps, so single phase uh, to seven, and then you, uh, which is 32 amps single phase, but you can three phase those. 90% of what we go looking for is the capacity and making sure it's available because otherwise it will fail. That's essentially how it runs. And the less scrupulous charge point manufacturers will just rock up. And they won't have done a proper survey and they won't have made sure that everything is, is in place. But if you don't have the, the power supply that you need to wire up to a 50 kilowatt charger, which will charge a vehicle in you know, 30 minutes to 80% full, you're stuffed. Building the business case is extremely important. It's the most important phase for me of, of this whole project, making the numbers stack up. What we need to do, we like probably two camps really, because we can have certain vehicles that are what we class as A to B cars, the standard production cars, and um, just go around doing different different tasks and different functions, um, and they will probably facilitate quite happily the eight hour overnight charging uh, infrastructure without any shadow of doubt or cause any plot of water. As you move through the rank and file, when you've got response vehicles and performance response vehicles, yeah. then you're looking down, you know, the rapid charge yeah. and things like that. So when we move this, when we move the fleet forward and technology meets up with it, um, we will have to then look at what we do and we will have probably a mixed bag of, um, of different infrastructure. And, what, and what's the appetite like for installing telemetry and sharing data with, with companies? to get that understanding. He, he's, he's key. Um, before I joined the, uh, the, the place that it was, uh, I worked in a Delmont service and we had to manage our vehicles, so we had a good <coughs> understanding of what those vehicles were doing. I think, like you say, when you've got data and when you've got information, you can then make a balanced, valid judgment. And we just mentioned before our business case and things like that. You do. When you're spending public money, certainly, you have to have a justification for spending. How do TrackMate help an organisation to understand their business. Initially, you might have some pushback from the lectins, and you, and you uh, but then I think drivers learn that it's, it's actually quite helpful. We've got private mode, so you can manage that exactly. Exactly. Um, sure long you. business mileage, yeah. so particularly if you've got a fleet where people are using the vehicles for their private mileage, you can sure. partition that quite easily. Um, also, with the, the, the R eight six hundred camera that we have, which is combined camera and telematics. Yeah. We found that uh, in some quite unionised uh, large fleets, they've taken that more on board because it's uh, been preventing kind of malicious insurance claims and they found it quite a positive thing to have the vehicle. Yeah, I'd be interested to know, I think another one question, how we can help with the electrification side of it, other than are we looking at using it or using it just to see the style, whether it's the driving or whether it's the use of the vehicle, and that's how the telemetry helps to match what a vehicle 
could use in the electric side of things, or, or is that what you're using? We use the telematics data, so basically we're looking at the utilisation of the fleet. So are, are there yeah. vehicles that are being underutilised, in yeah. which case you still need them? And we're looking at, at the predictability of certain journeys, so if you have a, a journey that's done quite consistently, then that's potentially uh, suitable for electrification, particularly if it's within the range of an EV. Um, and then looking across the rest of the fleet, we'll be able to partition them out. There'll be some that will be making a certain journey pattern where it's a no brainer to electrify them, some that will be a little bit more difficult, will require a little more thought, and some that will just be in the no mark now category. I used to work with the blower perhaps, and I think you put it quite, quite well. He said, it's, it's not Big Brother, we're not watching, it's more like Big Mother. It's, 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 it's a good term. Right? Yeah. And I think that, that little spin is it, quite funny, but it, it does show what it's, what it's all about. And uh, looking at those driving habits, it's about reducing uh, risk and things like that. So. But it's interesting that, take away the electric element of it, that should be interesting to a business as it is today, just from safety and fishing yeah. job. You know, yeah. Just from a business case of, I want to save money in the fuel. Yeah. That's the natural evolution of the whole driver behaviour model. Yes. I think it's going from where we're trying to increase MPG to we're yeah. trying to increase the range of electric vehicles. It's interesting how electric's forcing the issues on things you should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. The, the range of anxiety probably drives businesses that, as you said, utilising it correctly, whether it's from a safety point of view or whether it's from a fuel efficiency point of view. Operation. For the business, you probably should be doing something like that in diesel anyway. But your brain, your electric probably forces you to have those challenges um, you know, for a different reason. Well, when it comes to transporting our patients, you know, the vehicles are by the they're, they're made to a standard, um, or and they have to have certain things in them for, because we're the transport yes. people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, it just doesn't exist. And when, we, when we've gone, we've looked at some of the vehicles that we've, and I said, it needs to, you give a list of things that they will, they come back, and, and these vehicles are now massive because the batteries in them required to take them to and from. When it comes to transporting people, we haven't changed anything because we're not. I like what you said about being daring and taking risks. We can't take risks with people, especially in, in the net plants. We just can't do it. So until that technology is tested and proven, we purchase it. Then you'll find the office of bureaucracy kicks in. <laughs> <laughs> and what you want to find is when you ask for something, especially working in the public, I've worked in Brown and Paul. Yeah. If you ask for something today, right, you've got to try and second guess what you want when they when they actually approve it. Yeah. Because when you ask for something today, by the time they approve it, you've number one you forgot what you asked for. Yeah. And number two, what you asked for is no longer leading edge technology. And that's the problem. Um, and I think sometimes, like I said, there are levels of, and well, we can't do that, it's got to be a business kid, it's got to be somewhere else. Before you know where you are, you're in this maze of nonsense, um, and it all gets polluted and diluted, and, and, the, and, the and then all of a sudden, then you, you've been a maze, it's running to a dead end of that. Ah. The frustration that comes from, like, in, in the charging industry, really, is that the uh, the networks, so how you're charged, who's charging you, who yeah. you're paying for this for the electricity, there's so many operators and there's no join up. I mean, yeah. there is there is um, a movement now where there, there is a, a couple of companies that are trying to join back office networks together so that you can essentially surf the network. The, the frustrating thing from a government perspective is the government are in the position to roll this out across all departments, mm -hmm. which would create an unbelievable case study for the private sector, yes. not just for the public sector. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be, it's scary to, for that scenario, from my perspective, that, that hasn't been rolled out. We need to introduce um, kind, of, uh, kind of longer term thinking. So we're talking about spending public money on assets and infrastructure that could be in place for sort of five, ten years' time. And we also talked about uh, communication protocols for charge points and then being smart. Mm -hmm. So part of that future is also, uh, from an energy utility point of view, is looking at perhaps selling the electricity back to the grid that's stored in electric mm -hmm. vehicle batteries. So they're in effect mobile storage or intermittent storage, and increasingly kind of intermittent generation using renewables, solar generation in the future. But equally, you don't want to invest in charge points and all of this asset and infrastructure if it doesn't have the capability 
to do that in the future, even if you're not quite ready to do it now, but maybe in three, five years' time. It's it's not a case of you've got you install the charger and then you know you've got to change it in a few years because the the plug type has been standardised. So it's, it's not going away. It's going to it's going to be around um, for a good number of years. So there's, there's the potential to install with the confidence that it will still be relevant years down the line as you need it. If I need to operate and develop it, can I do that for the operational life of the vehicle? Yeah. What we're saying. Yeah. If you're on the vehicle for 14, 15 years, I mean, whatever you put in today, you know that within probably 15 months it's going to be yesterday, isn't it? Yeah. But if it's got the ability to be upgraded and you can develop it, then fine, and that's what you're looking at. Hi, no, so we can uh, do remote firmware upgrades onto the hardware. So really the hardware is the thing that will probably change the least quicker. Um, and then some of the things I was talking about, so optimising the charging, so perhaps you don't need to charge all the vehicles at once, um, it's also looking at the ratio of the number of vehicles, the number of charge points. It might not be one to one, you might need uh, less charge points in each complete. And you can use software to organise how those vehicles are charging. So they may be plugged in, but they might not necessarily all be charging at the same time. And it gives you the opportunity to match that charge point with how the electricity is going to be cheaper on the grid. You might want to buy it to the use of renewable generation. Um, but all of that is done in software rather than hardware. At the end of the day, the hardware uh, is a switch and it's a software that will control the charge point to switch on and off. But the chargers do the same thing. So you know this network thing I was talking about. The, so you can manage the loads through software. Like Sarah was saying, the, the software manages the loads. You can do all various different things and you essentially could release more power to the grid as you get a power increase or if as the cars are able to charge faster and various things like that. But the, the chargers have a protocol that they operate across, and that, that means that in the same way that you can remotely upgrade the telemetry, you can remotely upgrade the, the chargers, yeah. and there shouldn't be a cost to that. Obviously, what we're looking at now is a, a scenario where we're talking about upgrading and technology going out of date quite quickly. I think manufacturers are kind of realising that, because what we're struggling from it, a leasing perspective is that a vehicle which is coming into the marketplace now, in three years' time, could be you know, miles behind where we're at and how quickly it's advancing. So these these module vehicles which are coming in where you can you know you can essentially add batteries to it, you may even be able to add seats and the fuel, you know, which which when we're talking about second life of vehicles as well. So the cost of the actual manufacturing the hardware that's the vehicle, I think, yeah, okay, there may be a secondary cap cost to the company, but overall the whole life cost of the vehicle will reduce drastically. I wouldn't want the vehicle for longer than knowing that's an absolute. If I come to you for lease, I'll wait for a few years. So that's but, well, that's, that's just a shout out to all sorts of things. I can change things. Yeah. Yeah. So I've worn them for four years now, but I've been to another one two years because I don't want to be left them for that. That's really what seems is the dead batteries and the performance going right down the last few years. So I'll be looking at different ways. If you could change the batteries there. They are yeah. different, they change. Yeah. Yeah. It opens up another avenue, yes. Yeah, yeah. So correct. Which is a leasing cost, which will hopefully will drop that for you as a, as a company as yeah. well. And hopefully that's the way the market's going, because that's yeah. it's really encouraging for all in terms of CO2 mm -hmm. manufacturing costs as well. We also use some accountancy software at Deloitte. We're no. a Deloitte software program, which Sure, the whole life costs. And so we look at what the we look at what the capital cost is and the outlay and, and, and the white rate, etc. The, the write down cost. And we we compare that to something called whole life costing from a leasing perspective, which obviously takes into account not just the leasing costs but the fuel costs, the insurance costs, cost on national insurance, and we also look at it as well from an employee perspective as well. So this software is pretty powerful. Yeah, because it costs quite a bit of money each year. And uh, yeah, it gives you an overview, really, and you're quite right in saying that you know there are some assets where you know if you're keeping it for a long period, ten to fifteen years, no doubt the capital cost is still the best option. But there is obviously other vehicles where you're holding it for three, four, five years, six years, where the leasing is is essentially the best option to have. Them. And that software actually gives you a whole life cost across across both, really, and that, and that's something we use. You know, quite regular with our clients and go into and say, right, okay, buy that asset, don't buy that asset, lease that one. I suppose the, the argument has always been leased or bought, and I think now the argument from an analysis consultancy basis is, is it combustion engine or is it electric? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it FEVs? 
Mm. And there's that argument there where we're, we're trying to get that mix in. And Doit helps with that a lot. So, yeah, we've all got targets, which are social targets, but yeah. their software can do exactly the same as well. I think the leases are actually getting longer in some instances, especially with electric vehicles. So why are companies taking out longer leases? Just to reduce the, the cost? Yeah, yes, yeah. in essence. I mean, the cost obviously is a factor. Why not? You know, there is a factor there. Um, I think traditionally, when, when people have actually had electric vehicles on contract hire, the reason being is that because it fits a profile, and that profile usually is smaller mileages. Yeah. So you're talking five, mm. 6,000 miles per hour. And what we're finding is, is that given the drive chain, which is essentially just an electric motor, and the maintenance costs are a lot lower, there's actually a longer life period for this vehicle. So if you're doing 5,000 miles per hour in over five years, the vehicle's coming back to us in five years' time at 25,000 miles on it. Now, from a technology, I understand what you're saying from a future proofing perspective, but if you're doing 5,000 miles per hour, the majority of your journey is going to be under 50, 60 miles per day maximum. So that vehicle is future proofed essentially for that individual for the next mm. five years. Yeah. And I suppose, again, it's finding the balance. And don't get me wrong, we do have contracts where we're putting vehicles out, and we are putting electric vehicles out on 25,000 miles per hour. Mm. And those will go out on a three year period because <clears throat> people do see the benefit of the technology developing. We select the right vehicle for the right job or for the right person, depending on the, the policies, but the company policy has also got to be aligned to that as well. You know, and, and that's where it starts from an internal perspective is getting the company policy correct yes. and then filtering out the vehicles. Yes. Yeah. To match that specific. It was just that that we uh, again we're going through a bit of a change around the company car fleet and something that was really there, everyone's all excited about, you know, the DLK. Yeah. And I guess I'm appeared to be the one more playing devil's advocate around the, hang on, hang on, one about role profile and everything, but also realising we don't have an electric policy. Yeah. There isn't a policy and you have to light, align your policy. And actually the more we work at it, the more the realisation in my head is, is that you actually have to align that policy to drive the right behaviours and even, as you said, the petrol into the diesel. And long ago, here's your price bracket of your lease, any yeah. goal within that, you need to start being cleverer around. Massively. Some of that. So the policy element probably has to come first, and I think if not, we'll end up in the case where you get all the cars and then go, oh, okay. yeah. didn't see that. You know, I'll go into multiple companies throughout the year, and I'll have to put my HR hat on from a sales perspective, I'll have to put my finance hat on, and I'll have to put my fleet manager hat on, which all have different agendas. Yes. And it's obviously driving the cost savings and the benefits which that person values, and, and that's the key, really. But I mean, you know, if you position I suppose it's positioning the vehicles correctly. You should see cost savings, you should see HR benefit, and you should also yes. see a benefit to the fleet manager. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, you get it all. You've got people's minds saying, yeah, I need to do something. Right. And we've actually got an industry that's been caught with its trousers down, yeah. saying we can't supply the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is there an end to this madness? <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's, a, that's a very good question. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no not, not, not currently, I would say. Um, obviously, we've got supply issues with commercial vehicles. Um, you know, they're getting all the electric vehicles at the moment from the commercial aspect. is It's difficult for certain manufacturers. Uh, Norway at the moment, obviously, are taking huge amounts of these vehicles, leafs, etc., and everything. Is going over there because of the price of what they can sell and the government's you know subsidizing them quite heavily over there so there's there is supply issues we're going through a revolution at the moment aren't we but let's be honest and you know as long as there's money to be made then there's always going to be a better product that's going to come up next year and the year after and the year after yeah. so manufacturers are playing catch up at the moment massively you know we're going to get to a point i think within the next three years where Every single manufacturer will have an electric vehicle which is viable for everyone in the UK. I'm judging by what the manufacturers are telling us at this point. But then it won't stop. It won't stop it. We'll carry on. The batteries will get better and smaller and lighter. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I think realistically, we will be in a place in three to four years when everybody from a company car user, probably up to 30,000 miles per year, will actually be able to, to use an electric vehicle. I think that's really positive.
from our point of view, we use like a 330 BM as a pursuit car. Yeah, yeah. And we have um, a policy of three quarters to full. So if a car's just on its own, it goes three quarters, we fill it back up. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, we don't want to be caught short on the long or a response job. Yeah. So for us to use an electric vehicle in that role, mm -hmm. we need to be able to charge yeah. that yeah. up. Because we, we've got to be aware that actually we might pull up on a fuel pump and have to put it back in the slot because we've got a shot. So our law is that, that our car is behind the band bit and it's got 10% charge left. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had a conversation um, yesterday with a different police force um, who were saying the same things because obviously they have the same problems because yeah. they're doing the same job. But what they said was that uh, would it, well, were they, they were saying that they have, you know, like I think you said you had like vehicles, having vehicles. Yeah, yeah, we've got plenty of well hanging fruit like that. Exactly, like that. right, and all day long you'll take that because yes, that yeah. makes sense. But with your pursuit vehicles, you say, do I have an option? And I, I said to him, you, you, could, you could do the plug-in hybrid thing because you could be looking at a, uh, if, it, if it's just taken out, like your response vehicles, if it's taken out for a short period of time or a, a, a short route, then it will stay fully, as I was just discussing earlier, it will stay fully electric and emit yeah. less than our emissions. But on that high, like that high speed pursuit, be it a couple of hundred miles, the vehicle has the combustion engine to back it up, and therefore you you do I'm some of that. A lot of that is a, is a hybrid, purely you know any type of hybrid worth looking at for us. Yeah. yeah. The point is, is as we shift onto electric, the likes of BMW and, and other manufacturers are going to be less likely to build their cars with an internal combustion engine. Yes. Yeah. So what my worry is, then cars aren't going to be available. And if they are, because we've got exemptions and the military need to use them, they're going to be very costly. Yeah. So where, where you guys will be sat on the table going, I've got lovely electric vehicles and it's all worked out for now, and you know they're all cheap and they're, they're as cheap as what we're paying now for internal buses. Where we sat on the other side of the table going, well, these internal bus engines, I can't get them, they cost us a fortune. Technology is going to evolve as well. I think you mentioned earlier about batteries and whatever else. If you look where we were five years ago to where we are now, and it's, it's been an evolutionary process, hasn't it? You know, yeah. This and leave 90 mile, you know, get 180 or whatever. Else. So things are changing as well. So again, another five years, you're going to see another step yeah. change. Um, and what we don't see now, you know, we, we will have problems, perceived problems. Um, you know, there could be a solution out there um, with the battery technology as that evolves. Mm -hmm. um, so some of our problems may not necessarily be problems, but we are going to have to be, if your behaviour will change, and we can't do the same style of policing, if you want to call it that, than we do today. We might have to change the way that we deliver the yeah. service and whatever else. Right. We're all on this journey together, and it ain't easy. It's painful, it brings you to tears some days, mm -hmm. but it is worthwhile. 